All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to have everybody here today for uh, the next in our webinar series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Drupal 8's multilingual APIs um, and building multilingual sites for the, or building websites in general for the whole world. Um, this is a joint uh, presentation between the Drupal Association and Lingotech, a, uh, one of our uh, major supporting partners. Um, and we're really um, happy to have them with us today on the call. Um, the host today will be uh, Gabor and Christian Lopez, um, and we'll be um, going ahead and getting started. So I'll let them introduce themselves, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll start talking about uh, Drupal 8 Multilingual. Hi, um, I'm Gabor Hoichi. I work for Acquia in the office of the CTO, and I also was the Multilingual Initiative Lead for Drupal 8 for four and a half years. Hi, I'm Christian Lopez, Peña Skito on Drupal.org, and I work for Lingotech. And I've been working with Gabor and other awesome people in the Drupal 8 Multilingual Initiative. Yeah, so although uh, this is a joint webinar between the Drupal Association and Lingotech, what we are actually presenting is the work of more than 1,600 people who contributed to the multilingual initiative. So we'd like to start with a thanks to everyone who contributed and made all of these great features possible throughout the several years that we worked on this initiative. And the reason we started working on this is because people have been building multilingual sites for quite a while on Drupal, but the experience was very far from perfect. So if you start off with a Drupal 7 site to uh, make it multilingual, there's a lot of components to consider. First of all, you need to be able to set up languages on the site, which is managed by the locale module. And uh, that allows you to have a list of languages and also do some interface translation on the site. However, the interface translation itself works with files uploaded from your computer. It's very tedious. If you have 100 modules and five languages, you need to manually locate 500 files, download to your computer, and upload them to your website. It's very inefficient. So we built the localization update module that uh, allows you to automatically identify what to download. It downloads them and makes them available for you and imports them. It works quite well. Uh, but that's a contributed module that you need to add. And that doesn't really go anywhere um, else. It just automates your interface translations. So if you want to also translate content on the site, you need to enable the content translation module. And the content translation module works with nodes. It creates copies of your different nodes and as it translates them. So you can translate uh, your content, but your menu items for your content and your categories for your content will still not be translatable. So when you edit a translation, you will not be able to translate the menu item. So you also download and enable the IET NAND module suite, which comes with several modules, including features for menu translation, taxonomy term translation, et cetera. So that, that can, that, sort of uh, gives you a lot more flexibility, but still all the emails that are sent out to your users will be in the site's language. They are not possible to translate with either of these modules. So you also download the variable module suite, which is also several modules that deal with uh, uh, configuration on Drupal. And then that lets you actually translate the emails that are sent out to users and the site name, slogan, et cetera. Uh, but then you also have a store on your website, or you use the rules module or some other module that uh, is not using nodes for maintaining its um, content. So then you need to enable the entity translation module, which also comes with uh, several additional modules like title module that are required for it to work. And then you have views installed on the site and now you need to have the, um, the IETNN views glue module. And now you have web form installed on the site and you need to have the web form IETNN glue module installed on the site as well so it's compatible. Um, so each component that you want to have on the site may need to have its own um, glue module or mapping module to support multilingual features. And that very quickly becomes a maintenance burden. Um, there's a lot of components to 
uh, jug uh, to juggle with to figure out how to configure. So uh, one of the very key things in the Drupal 7 Lingo Tech module is actually making you um, making you able to locate these components and making it easier to configure um, the modules on the site in a way that makes sense. Because all the settings that you have here will be very hard to navigate. Especially once you have these modules installed, you have two ways to translate nodes. Both NDD translation and content translation can translate nodes. And you also have two ways to translate taxonomy terms, both NDD translation and IATNN translates taxonomy terms. So um, there's a lot of uh, possible problems that can arise from this scenario. So what we wanted to do in Drupal 8 instead is to make Drupal natively multilingual and support multilingual out of the box. So every other module that you add on top, if, if, whether it's commerce or rules or views or web forms, will already work in a multilingual system. So we built that using four pillars. Uh, and these are four modules that you can enable in Drupal core. So we have the language module that maintains the list of languages on the site. It's a, it's a base service for all modules to deal with language. And it also supports everything to store language information. So your views would know their language. Your menu items would know their language. Your user profiles would know their specific language. Your email text will know their specific language. So when you need to translate them, you know what's the source language. It's not just useful for uh, multilingual sites. It's also useful if you just want to deal with data that's multilingual, but not necessarily have the site interface as multilingual. Uh, also, we have the interface translation module as a separate module now, uh, which um, has automated translation downloads, and the built-in user interface is much nicer. So it's much easier to touch up on translations and um, deal with customized translation strings. We also have a content translation module, which only um, resembles the Drupal 7 version by its name, because it now uses a field translation-based system. So it's configurable on the field level, and in some cases, the subfield level, as we will see on the discussion later on. Um, and it supports any kind of content, including user profiles, rules, um, e-commerce, whatever uh, you have on the site. So it's very forward compatible in terms of content entities in Drupal 8. And then we have the configuration translation module, which provides a user interface on top of course uh, configuration language and translation management capabilities. So we have built-in functionality in core to manage language on configuration and to translate any configuration in the system, email, text, views, uh, field labels, et cetera, et cetera, in the same way. This is also forwards compatible for whatever you have in your contributed modules. So let's start with uh, language management. The APIs that we have for these are what's uh, going to come up in the sessions. So for language management, we have the language manager service in Drupal core, which you can globally access with uh, slash Drupal language manager. Uh, but you can also just get it from the service container. So with the language manager service, by default, is implemented by the language manager class, which is provided by the system. If you also enable the language module, then this is replaced with the configurable language manager. But basically, regardless of whether the site has a uh, language module enabled or not, you have a language manager that can deal with language. And even if you don't have the language module enabled, it, Drupal comes with three languages. The UND not specified language that is used for cases where you could specify a language, but you have no idea what to set. The not applicable language, which should be used for cases where it does not make sense to assign a language. If you have a photo of some scenery, does not have any text on it, that would be not applicable in terms of language. And English is built in uh, to core. If you enable the language module, then you can delete English. And you can also add any number of configurable languages. In this example, I've added Hungarian and Italian. And these show up in your configuration system. So when you export your configuration on the site, you will see all of these as language.entity.languagecode.yaml. And the only difference between them is the ones on the left will be locked, meaning you cannot edit or delete them. 
and the ones on the right will not be logged, so you can delete them, edit them, etc. however you want. You can also use the API to create these languages. Um, so you can use the configurable language class, um, and there's handy helper methods on the configurable language to make it easy to create new languages. So you say you create from language code fr, it will pull some default data from our list of common languages, and we'll set up the French language for you, and you can save that. And later on, you can use the same class to load the French language and delete it if you want, or make whatever changes you want to that language. So if you need a specific language, you can load that specific language and use it. But if you want to use the language that was used for the request, then you need to go to the language manager, which lets you get the current language that was negotiated for the request. Uh, so this runs through all the settings that you have on the site, whether it uses the browser settings for language detection or whether it uses the domain or the path, whatever, and gets you the language that should be used for this request based on those settings. And you can use this in your code to uh, display data based on whatever language uh, was selected for the page. So that's the basics of how you deal with language. But of course, the language module does uh, some other things that we'll not go into that are more uh, complicated. Let's go on to the interface translation system. So now that we can create our languages and load our languages and make any operation on them, and we can also know the negotiated language for the current page, uh, we may need to translate or, or strings for our user interface. So for that, uh, if you are familiar with Drupal 7, we have the T function that we can pass a string and it will get translated to the negotiated uh, language. And in Drupal 8, uh, we have the same, but we actually should uh, avoid it in most cases. Uh, internally, there are a lot of difference, and we are going to see some of them. So before that, we need to introduce a concept called dependence injection. So if, for example, we want to, to send an email to our users from our administration interface, our logic should uh, load the users we want to email. We need to load the configuration. Uh, and the preferred language of these users. And then we, we need to call the translation subsystem for translating these strings. And for that, like we need to know a lot about the global context our code is running. So instead, uh, in Drupal 8, we are reversing the arrows and we will uh, inject all the services that we need, all the classes that have the logic that we need to call, like uh, the user subsystem, configuration, and translation services. And we will call the methods on them. This way, we can swap them out. As we saw before with the language manager, we can swap the default core language manager and the language module language manager. And this also makes our code more testable, which is a nice uh, side effect. So instead of uh, calling T, what we are going to call is uh, BC function uh, with the same arguments that you used to. And we don't really need to define the T function in every class we are creating, but still we can use the string translation trait and this will include the string translation service uh, in our class and the T function. So we will call this T instead. Yeah, most base classes like form base and uh, other interface classes already use the string translation trait. So a lot of base classes, if you extend from them, will already have this available and you don't need to uh, care for it. In case you need to define your own class for something and you don't yet have of uh, the string translation trait, you can easily add um, the translation services this way. And as we said, uh, internally is quite different. So calling T doesn't return a string anymore. We get a translatable markup object. Uh, and we can uh, 
call methods on that, like get option for knowing which LAN code we, we call this function with. And these uh, strings will be only translated uh, when the rendering is actually happening. Uh, so if we are altering forms uh, in our hook form alter and changing, uh, removing strings that are there, they, they, they won't be actually translated if they are not really rendered. So it's like a nice performance improvement to have if they are not going to end in the final HTML or the final page. And for format plural, it's the same, uh, but in this case, it's even removed from Drupal core. So now we need to call this format plural instead. And this is included in the string translation trait too. So if we are standing for form base or we are using the string translation trait, we don't really need to define it uh, again. And from JavaScript point of view, uh, as in Drupal 7, we will have Drupal T and Drupal format plural, and they work in the same way. And for our templates, we have uh, two different methods for translating. Uh, in Drupal 7, we had PHP template engine. So we were actually including PHP code in our templates. Now we don't do that anymore. We have the tweak templating system and we, don't, we cannot call any PHP code anymore. So we have uh, two different methods for translating our strings. The first one on the top is uh, a filter. So we can use the trans filter uh, after a string and this will call the T function. Uh, if we want to have uh, placeholders in our strings or we are using uh, context, uh, it's not really readable, so we have a better option, which is the trans uh, tag in the bottom. And this way we, we include our, our placeholders and we can include any context that will, will be passed to the T function. Yeah, these will be parsed by on localized.drupal.org and by the POTX uh, module, and they will be these will be replaced by the play, the placeholder uh, items that you are probably or maybe used to from Drupal seven. So they will end up in a very similar way uh, as it as they were in Drupal seven, but the tweak side API is different. And uh, another difference between Drupal seven and Drupal eight is a uh, hook menu is gone. So now for defining our root and our menu links, we have YAML files. Uh, in hook menu, we had to, to define the title uh, in English and Drupal 8 will translate them for you. Uh, and we shouldn't use T there because uh, they won't be cached properly. Uh, in Drupal 8, we have these YAML files. We cannot include code there. So Drupal 8 uh, will know uh, in these YAML files which uh, properties we need to translate, which special keys we will need to translate. So we have the title here and the description for our menu links. And uh, Drupal 8 will call the pin function for us. And in the same way, uh, the POTX module will take care of extracting those. And if we are downloading our translations from localized Drupal.org, uh, it uses the same method for extracting these uh, strings for making them available to the community to translate for translation. So we said, uh, we saw in how we can translate our strings in our modules. We can make our models uh, available for the interface translation model for translating. And as we saw, we have to define our strings in English still, uh, and we can translate with the interface translation from English to any other language. And the next pillar is the content translation model. Uh, as we saw, it's not based on having copies of our nodes for each, uh, language, but instead we will have a, a field-based uh, translation approach. So any, any translation will be in the same entity. If we are creating our own entities, 
we will be probably extending for from content entity base and we need to define a, an annotation where we define the metadata of our entity we can say the id of this entity we provide a label and we can define if we want uh, that our site builders can define this entity as translatable for that we have the translatable key on the annotation and this will uh, make that administrators can uh, make these entities translatable they are not translatable by default but this is an option that our site builders can use and for making entities translatable and tracking the language of these entities we need a lang code entity key so we need to define a in the entity keys array we need to define the lang code entity with a field that will host the language uh, if we define our or base fields in the base field definitions method and if we use this lang code and we ensure that we call the base field definitions from content entity base uh, this field uh, will be created for us so we don't really need to do anything else and as an example in node php base field definitions calls uh, the parent base field definitions so this will create the language for our nodes and for any field that we have there we can call that set translatable method setting them to true and this will make a title of a translatable field by default so when we enable a translation for nodes in our content translation settings page a title will be defined as translatable by default but our side the builders can still change that if they want to so for fields if we are coding around fields uh, there are good news so trans they will be translatable by default so we don't really need to do anything for integrating our fields with uh, the translation mechanism in core yeah, this is for uh, configurable fields. So whatever additional fields that you put on entities would support translatability automatically. And also the other side of the previous slide where we've seen the title field, the title field itself does not need to do anything special for it to support translation. Only when it's defined as a base field, we can define its default translatability. So if you have a single value field, you don't need to, you define a new type of field that is single valued in your module, then you don't need to uh, think about the translatability consequences at all. That's all up to the site builder. However, if you have a multi However, if you have uh, multiple uh, values in your field, uh, you may have, uh, you may define your column groups. So you can have like in this example, we have an image field where we have uh, different columns, the target ID, which identifies the file that we have as an image, the width and the height of this image and the alternative text and the title. So here we are grouping our target ID or width and our, our height under a file uh, group. And then we have the alternative text um, as uh, another uh, group. So if we want to make a, or alternative text translatable by default, we have to set the translatable uh, key to true. And this way, in, when we enabled or or field or image fields for translation in the content translation settings page, the alternative uh, text and the title will be enabled by default and not the files, uh, but still the site builders can uh, configure that. Yeah, so in this case, the this is the subfield translatability that I was talking about earlier. In this case, the content translation module exposes these groups as settings for field translation. So under the field, you can configure the file as a, as a thing in itself to be translatable or not, and the alt text as a thing in itself to be translatable or not, even though this is under a field. 
and then the content translation module maintains the cap the right values for different translations based on the configuration of the groups. So there's nothing else need to be done for the groups to be able to operate just defining them in an annotation. So now uh, we can use the entity API for loading our content or content entities and we have also operations for managing trans, uh, translations here. So we can call node load for loading a, a node object and then we can call on this object, we can call different methods like get translation and passing a LAN code will get uh, this uh, translation from for Hungarian. Or if we don't need a concrete language, but we want to load the the negotiated language for the page, we can use the entity repository, get translation from context method, and it will use the negotiated language uh, for loading this node. In the same way, we have uh, several other methods on our content entities, like get untranslated for getting the source node, the language method for getting the language object that this uh, node is in, or get translation languages for getting the list of uh, available translations that we have, or has translation for checking if a, a, a given translation exists, and we can add translation, remove translation, and any other crude operations or on translation themselves. And when you call get untranslated or you call um, call get translation with the language code, you get a, an object that could be identically used like you have the node before. So you, it has the same methods and everything. So you can navigate around different translations and treat them as the same um, entity. And we are using node as an example here, but any other entity works, users, uh, menu items, et cetera. So we saw the Entity API is quite powerful, but we may even not need it. Uh, we have views in core in Drupal 8, and language is also integrated into views. So for views has two main uh, operations, which is requesting data from the system and then rendering that data. So we have language integrated in both sides. So on the left, uh, we can define which data we are querying into the, we are filtering in the system and we can use the translation language. So we can uh, filter by uh, having a given translation language. And then for the rendering, we, we can specify the language we want to render our content in. So we can filter all the content that has a Hungarian translation and then display it in German, as an example. So we, we may not really need to use the APIs. We may, use, we may use views for building or, or, or pages here. So as we saw, uh, we can translate with the content translation model, we can translate from any language to any other language. And what we are using here are intelligent objects uh, that we can call our methods and, uh, and operations for getting all the translations. All right, so next up is the configuration language and translation support. And as I've said before, this is also all built into Drupal core, much like all the things that we talked about earlier. And the way this works is we maintain language information on every piece of configuration that we have on the system. So when you look at the system maintenance configuration file, for example, this is the file in its entirety. So you have system maintenance.yaml. It has a message key that contains the text for what message should be printed when the site is um, set to maintenance mode. And it also has a length code key that says what language is the file in, all the stuff that is in the file. So this way we know that this setting is in English. And then different configuration files could be in different languages. So maybe the email text that you send out to users may be configured in Spanish and the a view may be configured in French, whatever you have set up on your site. 
So then Drupal knows uh, what source language it deals with and translate from there. And the translation is, ma is maintained in a way that uh, we, <clears throat> we are replacing textual keys in the configuration files with their translations. So we, we needed to have a way to define which parts of the configuration files are translatable. Because there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other data in the files that are not translatable and we need to avoid messing with them when we are doing the translation. So uh, we have the configuration uh, schema system to define the structure of configuration so we can uh, look up what's translatable. And the configuration schema system uses data types that are uh, dependent on each other. So at the bottom here, for example, we have the text type that is uh, based on the string type, which is a, a built-in type and is also translatable. So we use the text type for whatever is translatable. And we have the config object type, which is an associative mapping and has one key that's uh, defined as lang code, which is of type string. So we are using these type, uh, type pieces, these typing information to define the structure of our configuration files. And we are going to use the config object type and the text type to define the structure of system maintenance. So when we define the system maintenance file structure, we say this is a config object type. So it's an associative mapping that has keys and values. And one of the keys that are defined in config object is the lang code. So that's already defined for us. And we add additional mapping keys to this mapping. And that is the message key that we want to add, which is of type text. And we also provide labels for the translation user interface for this um, structure information. But basically, the type text carries forward the translatability uh, characteristic of the string. And the config object carries forward the language code key that we defined in the associative array. So when the configuration translation system looks at this file, it knows that the system maintenance is an associative uh, mapping. Um, it knows where to take the language code from, and it knows which keys are translatable, in this case, the message key. So we can store the translations for them. The way we store these translations is we have the base file in the configuration system as system.maintenance.yaml, and then we have languages slash language code slash system.maintenance.yaml which is uh, storing the translation for the keys that are translatable and have translations for themselves. So in this case, the message key is translated as whatever the Hungarian uh, equivalent of the message in English. And then the same applies for Italian as well. We store it under a directory, languages slash ID slash et cetera, et cetera. So when you export your configuration, you get all of your base configuration and also all of the translations all at once. The translations will be in subdirectories that you can identify. Um, and the configuration translation module is basically built to provide forms and pages to translate the main configuration files based on the schema information that we have of them. Uh, uses the labels from the schema, and then it generates these files uh, in the configuration system. And then we use these files as overrides on top of the configuration. So when a Hungarian version of system maintenance is needed, we load the original configuration and load the Hungarian file on top and merge them together. And then we have the Hungarian translation of system maintenance. And what's special about the configuration system is Language is not just one way that overrides may happen. It's also possible that there are other types of overrides on the system. There's, there may be um, global settings PHP overrides. There may be domain-based overrides. There may be time of day-based overrides or organic groups-based overrides or whatever other system you have on the site that, um, that could use configuration overrides. So when you load the configuration from Drupal using the, either the config factory or the Drupal config method, then all of the overrides will apply as appropriate for that point in time. And when you get the message from that configuration object, 
it will be the message of the override that win the race uh, of being applied um, in priority order. If you want to have a specific language uh, version of your configuration, that's maintained by the language manager. So this is unfortunately much harder to do than with the content entity API because the language is maintained, or the language overrides are maintained on the language manager. So you ask the language manager for the override language uh, to store for later, and then you set your own override language, in this case, Hungarian. And then you do something with the configuration, like send emails, as we've seen before. And then you set the config override language back to what it was before uh, to restore the state. Uh, it's not very nice to have global states like this, uh, but because arbitrary overrides are possible in configuration, there is no way the configuration system would know of all the possible variants of overrides that may exist on the system. But this is basically rooted from Drupal's history of allowing all kinds of uh, configuration changes based on groups or rules or uh, domains or other things. So if you want to specifically deal with um, these overrides or certain kind of overrides, then as I've said, when you just call up the configuration object, it will apply all the overrides and the strongest will win. If you want to have the configuration object in its original version without overrides, then the config factory service has a get editable method that loads you the raw original configuration. Um, and that has no overrides whatsoever. It's also possible to save back to that configuration object because it does not have randomly applied overrides from across the system. If you want to deal with the language override specifically, once again, you reach back to the language manager and the language manager has a get language config override method that you give the language code and the config key and then you can do whatever you want with that language override. In this case, uh, set a different value for the message, and then you can save it. So this is very similar to deal with as a configuration object. It's just stored at a different place in the configuration system. So the configuration API is not as nice as the content API because Configuration is mostly just dumb arrays. Uh, they don't really know where they came from, how were they merged, et cetera, because the whole override process is, uh, is not transparent to the configuration object. However, this also allows you to translate from whatever language to whatever other language. And it's a lot more flexible than content because you can have variants based on whatever else you want. Um, one more thing to note, is that we have all of these features in core, so you can have your languages managed, your interface translated, um, your content and your configuration translated, but these use uh, separate user interfaces, and there's no integration built in with translation memories or no integration with um, translation service providers. So that's, uh, that's a feature that uh, contributed modules like Lingotech provide very well where you don't need to care for whether something comes from content or configure interface, they make it much easier to deal with the translatability of um, your site. So once again, all of the features that we've presented are thanks to these 1,600 people who worked on these features for more than four and a half years and made all of these possible to work in Drupal core. So thanks to them for their contributions. Yes, indeed. I'd also like to thank um, Gabor and Christian for presenting today. Um, and um, uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of time for Q&A as well. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask about Drupal 8 multilingual APIs, about translatability, um, please feel free to use the Q&A button in the uh, webinar client or use the chat. We'll take a look there. Uh, in the meantime, Christian, would you like to talk about um, the, uh, the ebook that's available while we're waiting for questions? Yeah, so we have uh, an ebook uh, covering uh, all of what we talk in this webinar. Uh, it's free to load at the lingotech.com site. We will be also sending the link to every attendee with uh, the recording URL. So, yeah, 
if there's something we didn't cover, please feel to reach out or use the Q&A section. Awesome. Okay. Um, it looks like we don't have questions at this time. So I just want to go ahead and say thank you one more time to all of our attendees who joined us on this next uh, webinar in the Drupal Association um, series. Uh, I want to thank uh, Christian and Gabor again for presenting with us. And um, I would love to thank um, Lingotech for supporting the Drupal Association um, and for being just one of the uh, most important supporters uh, in our program. Um, they're leaders in the translation system um, and in cloud-based language management. So I encourage any of the viewers who have translation needs to check them out. Um, oh, and we actually do have a question or two coming in. Um, so we'll, we'll, let's go ahead and run through a few of those. Um, so the first one uh, from uh, Rogi, question about interface. Is there a way to set up different language for interface? Um, let's see, that's, that's, that's most of the question here. Let me take a quick look. Different, different than language for? I think that was meant for different than language for content. So, so yes, so Drupal core has a built in way uh, similar to what NDE translation had to have a separate language negotiation for interface translation and content translation. So you can configure um, them separately um, and you can display some content that's in a different language from the interface if you have that requirement. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, is it possible to have, this is from Patricio Cardo, is it possible to have uh, contextual translations? So I think we would need some clarification on that, but uh, if it means for a short text that needs context, like if you say view, what, what word does that mean or that kind of stuff, then that is possible the same way as it was in Drupal 7. So it's possible to provide in the format plural and the TAPI um, context information for the string. We also built in context information so that it's also in the JavaScript API and we also built in that possibility to the routing YAML files and the plugin YAML files, et cetera. And I believe it's also possible to do in the configuration schema. So I think all the ways where interface translation is involved, we try to make sure that the contextual, um, that the context is possible to define. So I think the answer is yes. Um, uh, let's see, next question. Are entities saved as a new entity when translated? So I can answer, so I, I will answer that one. Uh, no. So. Each uh, translation is host under the same entity. So if you have a content like a node in English and you translate it to French, you end up having one node which hosts both translations. So fields are translated, but we still have uh, uh, only one entity with all the shared uh, values between them. Okay. Um... The next question is, are there any issues with translation and translation of comments? So since it's the same entity, the comments are stored on the, uh, on the entity uh, and they are filtered for language when you display them in a language, um, but it's either configurable on the comment uh, field display or it could be configured if you swap out the field display to something else. So I think um, I don't build, I, I'm not aware that there are problems. Uh, it is also possible to translate comments themselves, by the way, because there's also there are also entities. So if somebody has that requirement, we've heard that requirement from a photo site where people were posting comments. This is a multilingual photo uh, portfolio site. Somebody was um, had a requirement to translate the comments because they wanted to show activity in all the languages that they've had on the site. So they wanted to have the genuine original comments translated to other languages. Um, and that was interesting. So some people uh, need that too. Okay. Um, 
Let's see, one more question here. Um, I believe this is our last question, but I encourage our remaining viewers to, to please go ahead and, and ask their questions if they have them. Uh, but this question is, what is the situation with multilingual and paragraphs module? In the past, there have been some issues. So paragraphs are uh, internally safe as entities. So you can translate your paragraphs and they are uh, referenced in the, the principal hosting content entity. So you can translate your paragraphs, but you can, uh, cannot translate the reference to this paragraph. So you can have a node uh, which have uh, three paragraphs and you can translate each of them, but you cannot reference like uh, three different paragraphs. I think there's uh, an issue on Drupal.org for that. And there's people working on that, but it ha has not been committed yet. Okay. So All right, I'll give it one more minute because I don't want to cut anyone off who might still have another question. I'm sorry about that earlier. Uh, but if we have any final questions, please let us know. All right, it sounds like we're good to go. So again, I want to thank our viewers. I want to thank our presenters, Christian and Gabor. I want to thank Lingotech for supporting the association and supporting the community. Um, and uh, if you have further questions, um, again, you can um, uh, learn about the multilingual initiative and the multilingual APIs on Drupal.org in the documentation. You can reach out to Lingotech to learn about their cloud-based language solutions. Um, or if you have questions about particular issues, I'm sure the issue queues, for example, the paragraphs issue queue, uh, will have some information about that paragraphs issue. Um, and at that time, I, at this time, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.